circa 1990. It's your boy Yvonne. And I'm LaDante. We are the founders and managing partners of New Age Capital, an early stage venture capital firm investing in dope tech startups founded and led by Black and Latino entrepreneurs. We've known each other for mm, 10 years now. And over the last decade, we've made it through college. We turned up, we traveled, survived corporate America, and started a couple companies together, ultimately leading us to where we are today. New Age Capital is the culmination of our passion for entrepreneurship, coupled with our deep frustration with the lack of venture capital invested in Black and Latino communities. Also, there was really no venture brand out there that connected with us on a cultural and interpersonal level, so we decided to create something dope that was authentic to our lifestyles. Little did we know, <laughs> raising a fund is hard as No, but seriously though, raising a fund? It's hard as f But we still out here though. So on our journey to build a new age capital, we decided to highlight some of the amazing entrepreneurs we met along the way. This is Chopping It Up. Today, we're talking to Kai Bond. Kai is the head of investing at the Catalyst Fund the venture capital arm of Comcast Ventures that invests in early stage startups led by minority entrepreneurs. He also heads esports and gaming investments and New York City seed investments for Comcast Ventures. Kai is a serial entrepreneur who sold his last startup, Pixie TV, a smart TV app to Samsung, so he definitely understands both sides of the table. Before we head over to chat with Kai, here's a quick history lesson. The American Research and Development Corporation, founded in 1946 by George Dorio, is credited as the first VC firm. It is well known for its $70,000 investment into Digital Equipment Corporation, which went on to be worth $355 million after DEC went public in 1957. In 1958, the U.S. passed the Small Business Investment Act, which allowed licensed small business investment companies to fund small entrepreneurial businesses and startups. Through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, venture capital ascended to becoming the go-to financing option for most technology companies. Fast forward to the late 90s, venture capital was booming as VC firms were pouring enormous amounts of capital into fledgling internet and tech companies. This tech boom ultimately led to the bust of the early 2000s in which many tech companies would have blowups of epic proportions, while a few companies would eventually go on to change the world and how we interact with it. Today, venture capital is a key source of financing for most high growth tech and tech enabled startups. However, the amount of VC dollars invested in people of color and women remain disproportionately low. Let's chat with Kai to understand how Catalyst Fund is turning this challenge into an opportunity. This is the inaugural season, inaugural episode of Chopping It Up. We're here with our guy uh, Kai Bond of uh, Comcast Ventures, uh, the Catalyst Fund. Um, you know, we've gotten to know you for a little while, and uh, we thought this would be the great first episode to have for Chopping It Up, um, talking about your experience first as an entrepreneur, kind of your journey through that, um, and now being on the other side of it, being an investor, um, and specifically also having a passion and focus on minority investors, which is, you know, synonymous with what LaDante and I are doing. Um, so we first like to say thank you for, uh, for, for joining us on this, um, and, uh, you know, we're hoping that uh, as viewers see this and you know people learn more about our brand and your brand that more than anything we can give entrepreneurs tools um, to really build their businesses and also you know get the reflection of themselves through individuals such as yourself um, you know that they may not know exist out there uh, so yeah, yeah. let's, uh, let's Appreciate get started. It. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good to be here. Look, tell us about yourself. Tell me where you're from, how you got into tech, um, how you got into entrepreneurship. Sure. Kind of give us a story. Yeah. So I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, and you know, during my childhood, I spent you know pretty much half of the year, you know, all of my summers, a good part of the winter in Botswana, where my mom's from, um, and you know, through that experience of traveling back and forth from you know Connecticut to Botswana, um, it was always fascinating because when I went there in the late '90s, everybody had a Nokia phone, <laughs> Sony Ericsson phone, right. and technology was just a part of, you know, no one had a, a computer, right? That, that skipped straight to mobile, right? And in the US at that time, you didn't have cross-carrier text messaging, <laughs> you didn't have, you know, 3G networks, and 
you know, for me, you know, when I traveled back in the late 90s, I realized I was like, this is the future. Like people are talking, they're listening to music, they're taking photos, crappy little photos, but sure. they're taking oh. photos and using this device in a whole different way than we even imagined in the US, you know? And growing up, my father was an entrepreneur. So he had a business and when he would drive around from meeting to meeting, he would dictate the call. He was the head of sales too. So he would get out of that, get into his car, drive to the next meeting and he would hold up his dad and he would just record and just talk about the meeting and the notes and the next steps and the action items and send to his sales team. And so I would get that, he would come home, I would take that, pop it in and I would just transcribe everything. And I would transcribe the notes for a sales team. And you know, at that point in time, I was just like, this is boring. Yeah, <laughs> what am I right, doing? Right. I don't understand any of this. Yeah. And it just starts to sink in and you just have this natural, you know, progression into, oh shit, I have this skill, you know? And his father was an entrepreneur. Yeah, and so, so the two of them have never worked for anybody else, you know, in a full-time capacity. And so it was just ingrained in me, right? It was like my father was a technologist and an entrepreneur and my mom was part of the family business and mobile was really what got me okay. kind of like focused. And so, you know, when I graduated from Wesleyan, you know, during my time there, I did two internships um, during my time at Microsoft. In my first internship at Microsoft, I went in and I built a website in, co in college um, called Pangea Web. And Wesleyan's in Middletown, Connecticut. You've got Boston and New York, it's halfway. We were just trying to figure out how to get to the best events yeah. and have the most fun and maximize getting off campus. Right, 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 who was right, DJing right. where and what events were going on in New York and Boston that we could go to. Um, and so building that, we built this little community of artists and we were all wrong. We were trying to charge people to post content. I mean, the whole business model was fucked up, but we were focused on something that we thought was transformative at the time. And so I wanted to go and work on mobile internet applications and that was my main thing. I went to Microsoft and I wanted to do that and they, get, they got me an interview with MSN and they were just like, you are not ready to be here. Like we're getting the best engineers from the top tier schools and it was almost like they felt bad for me, you know, because I wanted it so bad. Like, I remember going to the HR department, you know, at Microsoft, and they were like, they cut my interview short after half a day. I was supposed to interview a whole day and a half day. They sent me back to this thing. It's just like, I don't really think it's working out, you know, and I was like, shit. It was the same feeling I had when, before. I, when I got into Wesleyan, I got waitlisted. And it was the same like sinking feeling in my gut when I opened that letter. Is like being like, you should go back to yeah. building, you know, <laughs> building four or whatever. I'm like, shit. So I get there and they're like, we don't know if there's a fit. We're gonna have you talk to this other group. And the group that I ended up working in for my first internship was customer service and support oh, wow. and MSN internet access. So this is the days when the disc, pop it in, yeah. connect, you know, AOL was flying high and like that was my job. Yeah. It was like, yeah, I'll take whatever I can get to get in the door. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, I, and, and you know, in, in that summer it was hard for me. I went there but they gave me an amazing mentor, this, this guy by the name of Mark Spain. Mark worked down the hall from Bill Gates. Um, and I was in Mark's office one day and Bill came by to check on something. He was like, hey, I'll introduce you to, to Kaiso. He's an intern here, you know, and I was like, all right, cool. You know, stood up, shook his hand. And he was like, how do you like the program? And I was like, it's good, you know, this, that, and other thing. I'm like, like this, training, and I'm learning more. But, you know, he always used to have this party for interns. I was like, but I'm not invited because they only do it for product teams. I work in support, like, Part, part of the game is that, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Come through like, I've seen the pictures, it's amazing, you know, like, can I come by? Like, it was good. And, like, two hours later, I get back to my office and there's an email, it's like, you've been invited, you know. Nice. To, oh, nice. To so, so, you know, it's always one of these things, it's the same thing, you know, when I, when I got waitlisted to Wesley and it was like, I called my father, he was at the office, he called me back a little while later, he was like, you still want to go there? And I was like, yeah, he's like, Pick up the phone and call him. Tell him it's your first choice. So I was like, well, all right, yeah. It makes sense. Seems logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like at this, this point in time, nothing was online. You had the handwritten joint. So I call up admissions office. I'm like, hey, this is where I'm on. I want to play soccer. And I'm in state and blah, blah, blah. She looked at my profile. She's like, give me one second. She walked down. She was like, I just talked to the head of admission. The, the head of admissions, like, you've been accepted. You'll get an email. Wow. You'll, you'll get a letter in two days. Congratulations. You know, and, you know, it was like, Sometimes you just gotta ask. Yeah, you, you know, know. close you mouths don't get it, fed. It, yeah, and so, so it was one of those lessons early on. Like immediately pick up the phone, immediately call, immediately ask. Right. Yeah. So 
that was a big lesson for me and I just continued and everything I did when I was there, I was just like feeding into that and I would see the other people around me asking for stuff all the time like, I get a $4,000 computer, can I get this? And there was like, yeah, I was like, all right, cool, I'm gonna start doing this. And so, you know, when I, when I was at Microsoft, I just took all the classes I could in engineering, in product, in design, they offered up just this continuous training platform for me. So for 12 weeks of that summer I learned, I went back next summer, they had me back and I worked in MSN, back in the classroom, you know, after work every day, trying to get more technical, trying to get better at what I was doing, and then I was offered a full-time job. Wow. And so I went back and I worked in mobile when I was at Microsoft. And that was Windows Mobile, I was working on messaging platforms in 2001, none of that existed in the US. I was in Asia and working with NTT Docomo, I was in Europe working with Vodafone and T-Mobile, um, and that was the first three years. And it was this tiny 20 person team pushing messaging services and pushing what I consider the future of that layer of mobile that is still today what you see with the WhatsApps of the world, right. and the communication yeah. layer being the most important aspect that brings us all together. And so it was fascinating to work on it there. Um, and the team grew and grew and grew and Windows Mobile was getting bigger and bigger and then you know there's Palm Pilot and Blackberry and like this was just the beginning and we all continuously thought like all right the evolution of the internet mobile internet's coming, the evolution of devices is coming. And these were conversations you all were having internally. Internally, two thousand two way, way before the iPhone. And so we, you know, when I came back to New York, I was like, I wanna, you know, I wanna get into startups. Like, I need to be early in this. This is where everything is. So my family's, you know, moved from Connecticut. My parents live uptown. My brother lives uptown. So I came back to New York, um, and I wanted to be in New York. I liked the grind in New York. My family was here. My friends were here. So I came back after three years, and I started working at startups. And every startup I worked at was like mobile focus, I worked at mobile gaming, worked on mobile campus and social for colleges and universities. And you know, through that, that journey of, of you know, kind of learning from great founders who raised a lot of money working on interesting products, I just kept getting closer to the top of the decision making tree with those founders. Mm. And it came a point in time where I was like, this is what I wanna do. I, I gotta work at a startup and by the way, Everybody here is great, but they're not that much more differentiated than I am. They're not that much better at engineering. They're not that much better at sales or business development. They're not that much better at product, but they have this one skill that I know nothing about, and that's navigating the venture capital ecosystem <laughs> and really? raising money, right. which is an entirely different skill than making a good product and making something that people want. And that doesn't matter. You don't have the opportunity to do that unless you know how to navigate that landscape to a certain extent. You can try and you can get far, you can bootstrap. It's difficult, and so, I decided I'm gonna go and take a job at a big company, stash away a bunch of dough, save up some money so that I can go and bootstrap a business. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And we started you know, my first company in 2007 with my business partner, Jason. And we learned a lot of lessons the, the hard way, right? We, we were working in video games um, prior to that because I always thought, you know, from messaging, we saw gaming. I was like, gaming's gonna be this huge thing in 2005 on mobile phones, snack by content. We wanted to get in that. When you create a game, it's really hard to ship an MVP. It needs to be polished. People want the right music, can't crash, can't be buggy. It's not a utility, it's for pure entertainment, right? And so we took that mentality into doing web development, which is the antithesis of what you want. <laughs> and so we made a bunch of mistakes and we got better and I tried to go after that business collapse. And, and that was the, that first business of raising money from angels and scrapping through it, hiring and making the wrong hires and, we learned so much in, in you know, that year and a half, two year period. Talk about that a little bit about like, I mean, even coming out of Microsoft and, and then understanding, okay, now I gotta get into a startup world because I, I had this hunger for it. And then realizing, all right, maybe I wanna start my own a little bit. What gave you that, first, what gave you the confidence to, to go ahead and start your own company? And then how did you even navigate making hires? How did you, like, where did you pull those resources from? I think, shit, forming an LLC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, 2006, there wasn't information online. You right. can't go and Google and search anything. And so there wasn't the same access to this is what a standard term sheet looks like. Um, you know, it was even more tribal knowledge. It was even more of, of a locked off ecosystem with no transparency. Very few people were blogging or writing posts and really being transparent about venture capital. And so 
you know, I was fortunate that my business partner was already running his own companies for years. He had never worked for anybody. So, so I kind of was like, I have an idea and a vision and access and a network, and you've been running your own company for 15 years. Like, wow, just like it came together and everything was there as a recipe right, for success. So I was fortunate in that aspect that I found somebody who we developed a working relationship while working on a game together and then realized that he had the right skills to kind of help me understand how to navigate that, sort of forming an LLC, getting the paperwork and the docs together. But I think the genesis of it was, one, I thought and felt I had the core competencies in to create products that people loved. I had a desire and a passion around launching original either content or ideas that no one else was pursuing. And so the third one was kind of a re realization. And it was a gentleman by the name of Don Ryan. He worked at Microsoft with me and I was talking to him and Don was like, look, entrepreneurship is the truest expression of oneself. There's no reason why you do this. <laughs> it's not logical. Like 99% chance you're not gonna succeed. You're probably not gonna make as much money as a normal job, but why do you do it? What is it that drives you? Is it transformation of an industry? Is it a passion to help other people? Is it pursuing your own dreams and vision? Um, you know, I was fundamentally like unhappy working for other people. I just, it was very difficult for me to sit around and feel like I wasn't able to maximize what I wanted to, to accomplish. And so some of it was selfish on my part. Some of it was, I want to do something bigger, right? And that was a driving force behind my decision to get into entrepreneurship. And I felt like it was the right time. You know, I, it, there's never a right time because you always want to have more money saved to boost up. You always want to, but it doesn't matter. The younger you are, the bigger the risk you take. The only regret I have about my entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey is that I didn't start it earlier. If looking back, the moment I left Microsoft, I should have just gotten an entrepreneurship on my own and started my own company and driven from there. Unfortunately, that wasn't, you know, wasn't the path, but um, it was, uh, there was a lot of learning around the way, and along the way, rather, and the first company is particularly hard. You know, I always tell the founders that I work with, early stage founders, it took me seven years before I was a good CEO. And it's like pretty much anything else in life. At the beginning of it, you suck. When you're a kid, you can't eat, you can't get food in your mouth, you can't ride a bike, you can't write sentences, you don't know how to speak, and that never discourages you. You would never get frustrated, you never feel like a failure, right? But along the way, somewhere along this journey, you can't fail. If you don't get into this high school, you're not gonna get into this college, you're not gonna get into this graduate program, you're not gonna get this job, and failure becomes uh, a, a, a motivating factor, but, but failure is, is a fear, and a lot of people can't overcome that fear of failure over time, and so, you know, one of the things I look for in entrepreneurs is coachability, right? Because you need to get better at your craft and get better. And, and you know, early on, you know, at Switch Games, we had mentors, we had coaches, we had guidance, and some of those coaches weren't good, right? It's like, what type of advice do you take? But it was a difficult path. I mean, when I was working at Switch Games, you know, there was a point in time where I maxed out every credit card I had. You know, the last pitch meeting I had I was trying to go to a VC to meet with them and I, I lived in the East Village. I went to the F train stop on the 2nd Avenue line, um, 2nd Avenue in Houston, went down, swiped, tried to get a Metro card, didn't have any money, so I hopped the turnstile. Hopped the turnstile, I hear the train coming, so I'm r hustling down, it's a crazy long set of stairs at that stop. Running down, see the train coming, see a cop coming. See, see the train, train coming, see the <laughs> cop coming. <laughs> I'm like, uh, train coming. He's like, I gotta get on the train, and it's noisy, and that's stopping. I'm like, I, I gotta I get gotta. to this meeting, fam. And at that time, I wasn't going to present anything on the screen. I had printouts, you know. I'm yeah. like, Come on, man. I'm trying to get to this meeting. I'm just, you know, I'm trying to pursue my dreams, yeah. you know. And now here I am with no money with a cop who's like, I gotta go upstairs and radio your license in, cause I don't know if you have any violations, you know. 15, 20 minutes later, he lets me go. I'm late for a meeting, I can't show up there now, I'm distraught. 
you know, and I just went home and I not just bought. I was like, I got nothing right now. You know, I got a failed business. I got no money. I've got no one I can turn to. I'm not asking anybody for anything, you know, and that was one of the hardest moments of my life. And then I went back to an office job a couple months later and I sat down and they were like, you need to go to orientation. And I was like, no, that wasn't the worst home. moment. <laughs> I have to go home. Like, I, I, I didn't make it. That, that wasn't the worst shit. moment of my life. That was like, that was, yeah. I, just, I was like, I got to go. Like, I can't be here. I looked around at everybody sitting in the cube and I was just like. Just saying that. I can't do it. So I went and I just, you know, I, I, I went and hustled and I got some contract work and then got back on my feet, cleared my head and then started another company. Yeah. So that was the, the, the you know, the next, and the next startup was interesting. I did that one out of Hatch Labs. And Hatch Labs was, you know, um, an accelerator program. Um, we had LPs that included IAC and Extreme uh, Venture Partners. Yeah. And Didn't Tinder, Tinder, Tinder was yeah, the, the, the big sort of right. breakaway hit. At that point in time, we created a company called Cash Play Games, which were chance based casino games tied with. Um, um, a sweepstakes based engine so you can win real cash playing chance based casino games and you know Jason and I had always been in the game space he had a studio we figured out this model and this arbitrage business that we thought was really interesting and we were always building this because we thought passport reform was coming in 2012 right so in 2010 we launched this business with the hopes that in a couple of years we thought that the regulatory environment would change and gambling would become legal we were six years too early because that just happened. <laughs> but we had this vision around what we wanted to create. It was really successful. I mean, we got to a point in time where we had an offer on the table from a publicly traded business with a multi-billion dollar you know, market cap. And we went there and we sat down and we went through diligence and our banker was there. You know, we had only raised six hundred thousand dollars. You know, we were gonna make a lot of money. But we thought a lot of money, like, oh, we're about to come up. And I looked at my banker at the end of the day, and he's like, "This is a layup. Like, we're done. This is good. Like, let's go out and celebrate." I was like, "Ah, we'll fly the team home. I'm gonna stay another day if they want to do diligence some more. I have some friends in the city, and I'm, I'll come back. I'm gonna take the red eye home on Friday night. My friend's got a wedding in the city, so I'm just gonna hang out and make sure everything's good. I'm in the airport." get a phone call, I'd have missed it, get a text message from my banker, call me. I'm like, it's never, never a good sign. sign. <laughs> Somebody text you, call me. So, so I call, call homeboy, I'm like, what's up? Board it, literally, tick it out. Before you tick, tick it out, I'm on the phone. Deal's off. Wow. It's like 10.50 and the LOI expires at midnight. Right. I'm going back. He's like, nobody's at the office. <laughs> like, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night. Like, I was like, I'm going back. I'm like, got out of line. Yeah. You know, I'm fuming. I get on the plane. Like, Can I get you anything? I'm like, bring me some bourbon, yeah. you know? Yeah. Drink on the flight back. Um, and so you go from having a $20 million exit after nine months of building a company to back to the drawing board. My team was at home that weekend thinking, I've got a couple million dollars banked right now. Right. I show up to my Monday meeting. I'm like, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is nobody's moving from New York because nobody really wanted to move for the acquisition. It's right. so like the bad news is the acquisition's off. And I'll never forget my CTO at the time. He's a good friend. He just looked at me. And I looked at the faces around the table, just eerie Brilliant. silence, just, and people started asking some questions and about two questions in, he just closes the laptop. He was like, fuck those guys. I'm going back to, going back to my desk. Wow. Like, we've got work to do. Wow. And so, you know, that was a moment and we, none of us really wanted the deal, but it was the right thing for money, but we didn't sure, really yeah. believe and it was just, we went in, we didn't have a good feeling about it. And so, it, maybe it was, a, it was a blessing in disguise, but nonetheless, a couple, you know, we were like, all right, we'll go back to the drawing board. We're gonna raise some money now. Yeah. Superstorm Sandy hits. Wow. wow. VCs are shutting up, shutting the doors. Like, 
I got a, I got a house out east. I got a nice place in Tribeca or Chelsea that's flooded. I don't know what's going on. I'm not in the office. Like, door shut. So that asset went to zero. We're $20 million to four months later going to zero. Wind that business down. So what do you do? Start another company. So for me, mentally, because of how much I give and put into a business that I start. You, I, every time a company shuts, I just get violently ill. Mm. My body shuts down, you're working 16 to 18 hours a day, go to sleep thinking about work, you wake up sleep thinking about work, Saturday morning you're in the office, Sunday you're in the office, and that break in between of six months is the only thing that allows you to recenter and get your mind back. So I'm always leery of people who are like, I'm gonna start this next thing right away. And I'm like, hey, no, I, don't know. I couldn't do that, yeah. you know? So, third company, I start that one, and get the band back together this time. Like the first time, you're like, how did you do it? You right. know, and I was watching the NBA Finals or Eastern Conference Finals when LeBron was getting hacked and he lost his headband in that game. And people started talking about it. It's the first game he ever played without a headband. <laughs> and people were gigging on him, it was, you know, whatever. So I'm sitting there following my Twitter feed. And um, in that game, I think he scored 19, 19 points in a row, like 23 points in the fourth quarter. He's going crazy. One of the greatest players of all time, having a historic performance, and I'm looking at Twitter on my phone. This is broken. And so I, I was like, this needs to be solved. And then immediately it came to me. I was like, why can't I get my content that I want on television? I paused the TV, it was, I think it was ESPN on ABC. So during commercials, they still had that ticker across the bottom of my way and counted. I was like, 120, could definitely get 140 characters here. They got a commercial here and they got a headline over here. The right font, the right background, you can make a totally readable 140 character set. Boom, I'm gonna do that. Called up my designer, called up a former engineer, got some wireframes and designs together hacked the project together in about 72 hours. This is when Twitter still had open API access to their trending TV stuff. Access, boom, magic happens. We hack together this thing. My Twitter feed's running on a TV in like 72 hours. I'm like, this shit is crazy. <laughs> like, yo, we back. And I'm, I'm like, this is something real. Right. Like, we started to get the sense. We started showing it to other people. And they were like, what is that? And I was like, and then we made a decision where we basically bet the company early. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars from a strategic. And with that money, we only had a team of three. Designer, engineer, and myself. So I looked at my team and I was like, sports are the only thing people are tuning in real time for, right. or tuning in live for, and the only thing that you can use real time. So let's just create a custom ticker for your fantasy football scores. So it's your scores, your opponent's scores, injury reports, league standings, and we created it, we showed it to them, and they were blown away. We launched it, we put it in the Samsung App Store, they promoted it in a tweet, we got some users. Oh, so you got it into Samsung? Yeah. Okay. And so Samsung was supportive, they right, were a strategic yeah, the investor yeah. for us. We didn't have a huge user base, but the people that used it were spending like seven hours every Sunday. They turned it on at the one o'clock game on the Eastern That Sunday engagement. And yeah. just keep going. going, and we knew there was something there. So we decided to take the business and say, we're gonna keep the front end experience part of the business, but we also believe that if we can pull them on the platform for the development side, for their smart TV apps, we can have a real business. So we ended up creating something that was a B2B to C business, that was a smart TV app that essentially looked like Squarespace or Wix for smart TV app development mm. with an interaction layer on top where we would give them all the picks and shovels. So you wanna run your XML, you know, RSS, JSON feeds and provide content that you're tweeting out on social or from your website. And we have a whole toolkit where you don't even have to do anything. So a product manager with no engineering resources, no designers could come in and it was a thing of beauty. We would have put two TVs up. I would run my development environment, my WYSIWYG editor, pull in their feeds, type in some keywords, put on their TV station, blast it on and pow. Like, Seamless experience running on top of their broadcast in 30 seconds and they can start promoting their smart TV apps. So it was this great cycle of taking what they were doing well in live TV, enhancing the experience and then driving installs to their apps. Their apps are now more cost effective, getting more engagement, driving that analytics, cost per install revenue. It was this, you know, we, we sort of deemed it as a one-stop shop. We ended up 
you know, being acquired by Samsung, rolled into the TV division and tucked into a special software unit here in the US. And so they, they acquired Boxy to sort of work on the operating system. They acquired Pixie. We worked in the same office. They had a, a center um, for software out in Mountain View. And that was when, you know, we had the opportunity to really take that product and take it from, you know, tens of thousands to millions of daily active users, right? And so seeing that come through. And that was, we started building that product during the Eastern Conference Finals, I believe that was May. We hacked the product together over Memorial Day weekend. And then it was June, we raised funding, we closed right before the 4th of July. We started building basically from July, I think it was like the 8th, right through August, so that we could hit the beginning of football season for CBS. And then we had our offer for acquisition in April and the transaction finished in August. So it was really like a 13 month window of time. And we only had four, four engineers, engineers, a designer, and myself. And that was, so it was a team of six. <laughs> so with this third company, yeah. and the, you had your two previous, what did you take from the first two that you brought to this one? And why do you think this one was so successful? I mean, there's many factors, but why do you think this one was more successful than the first two? We drew on experience both positive and negative. You know, we focused on data. We focused on data. Like, we didn't come in with this egotistical view that because I thought something was cool and the rest of the world people needed it. that everybody else was going to like this. The first thing we learned was it wasn't about custom content. Oftentimes you're watching with a partner, a spouse, a friend. They don't care about your scores or your Twitter feed, but if it's contextually relevant, that's meaningful to everyone. So we, that was the first thing that changed. You know, and so the focus on data was key for us. Uh, we were willing to put out product really, really quickly and learn from those products and hack it together. And that was a key component for us. Um, building a culture, you know, was actually a big part, you know. Hiring engineers is always one of the hardest things you can do. We got Palantir engineers, we got top tier folks to come over and work for us. And, and the first thing I said when I was recruiting engineers was, I already know that you think you can start your own company. <laughs> you can, obviously you can. You can write the code, you can write back-end code, you can write front-end code, you can launch a product. You, can't, you can build a product, you can't launch a company. So what I'm going to do, if you come on here, is teach you about term sheets, help educate you on the fundraising process, help walk through all of the things that I've learned over the last few years so that when you leave here, you will become a founder. You'll come here as an engineer. Keep that talent bar high so that they feel like they're improving and getting better along the way. You know, we had a, I have a very specific philosophy around hiring and sort of the elasticity of how individual growth and development and progress, ownership and contribution to a product play with how fairly compensated you are and you know, how much you like, respect and admire the people that you work with. And so I tried to find this balance. I think people over index on likability and don't, over-index enough on trust, respect, and admiration for people who work with them. You're not always gonna wanna go out for drinks or hang out with the people you work with, that's okay, so long as you admire how well they do their job and why you're around. You know, I also focused, you know, we burned ourselves out at the beginning of these companies when we were working hard, and I got to a point where I was looking at my engineers and how much productive engineering hours they could put into writing code, and then how that transforms when you launch a product and that shifts from writing new code, to fixing bugs, doing research, studying, creating internal tools for your engineering team so they can develop faster and respond to client needs so they're not running the same reports and pulling data. And so I really got to a point where at the beginning we're writing all of this code to go out to market. As you're collecting data, you're now writing tools and platform tech to allow you to go faster. And so each engineer loves the fact that they can write their own platform tools to help themselves. Right. So we were writing tech for companies and business and media platforms for end users and for ourselves, right? And after three months, you would see those tools that we had just give this exponential lift in our ability to pump out. And so we had a shit ton of technical debt after 60 days to get our product to market and then immediately scrapped everything and built it from scratch again to make sure it was a bulletproof platform as we move forward. And that rigor and focus on gaining data and then building for ourselves is what allowed us to scale with a tiny team like that. And 
So I do think there's a balance between that. You can do that with some consumer apps. You know, you can't do that in, in robotics. You, know, you can't do that in certain right. markets. But that worked for us. And we applied those lessons. And I focused rigorously on going back one-on-ones with my team. What am I doing? What as a team can we be doing better? What can I be doing better? It takes six, six months for people to, honest, to give you an honest answer. You have to coax it out of them. You have to you know, be, you know, be negative and beat yourself up so they know that you're willing to get that type of hard feedback. So the feedback loop for me of, I do not want to fail, but I'm fine with understanding what I'm doing. It's contributing to our failure so I can you know, respond to that quickly and improve and get better. And so all of those things combined ended up with this recipe where I never questioned what my designer wanted to do. He knows the font, the color, the design, the layout. My engineers, I never talked to them, well, why are you using React or Node? Like, no, you have ownership of that. And giving people ownership over what they do inside of a company is so critical so that they stay engaged and they feel like there's a real passion for that product. Um, so um, uh, let's touch on that a little bit because I, I think we pulled in a lot of pieces and the interesting thing is we've gotten to a point now where a lot of the struggles you went through, uh, a lot of these opportunities and access to, to platforms that can help start, you know, founders build things quickly have been democratized. So in, you know, the time we're in right now, how do you feel as though, you know, if you're a founder right now that similar to you, fundamentally, I can't do what I'm doing anymore or there's so much broken here that I need to fix it. I want to go out, strike on my own. I need to put a team together. I'm not an engineer. I need to figure out how to build this. Um, and someone that actually has that desire, ambition and capability and coachability to do it, where should they start right now? What are the main things they should focus on? Um, and, and you know, how should they proceed? Yeah. I mean, I'm somebody who is build first, right? So each one of my products that I've worked on is start building. If you have an idea, if you have a passion area, you can write a 10 page, you know, slide PowerPoint deck. You can come up with a business plan and a business model. And I think those things are important, right? And I'm not trying to dissuade individuals from doing that. I think sometimes walking through a very coherent deck around your business model and distribution. But I think at the end of the day, if you are making a product, you wanna be able to build something, you wanna have that validation, right? Being able to pull on technical talent early is key for me, right? Because I do think your product's gonna change and it's going to be different over time. And the ability to respond quickly and react, if I didn't have those engineers that were sitting there side by side saying, do you see what people are actually doing when we're working through this? And we need to build tools around this, that wouldn't exist. So, you know, I think having a co-founder is important. I'm not against being a solo founder, but I just think you gotta get to a point where you're putting enough time in that you can validate to yourself or small groups of people around you that there's something there besides an idea. The only way to do that is to build. When do you make the decision to come to the other side of the table? When was it, when did you know it was time to depart and actually start working on investing? So after about a year, we launched that product globally. It was, it's difficult to go back and work in a very large corporation after you've been a six person <laughs> team, uh, to say the least. So, and it was a unique point in time in my, in my life. You know, my son was born, I was flying you know, around the globe to Seoul um, and then to Suwon once a month, you know, on the West Coast, you know, once a month, team there. And so I was starting to really think about, you know, what do I want to do next? And I was presented the opportunity to go to Samsung next and run their accelerator here in New York. And during that time, I did about nine investments, very small. What's Samsung next? Samsung next is the uh, sort of the software um, uh, unit in the U.S. that has an M&A team, a venture capital team, an accelerator and a partnerships group. And the idea was to build, buy, partner or invest in the best software startups in the world to add value to the hardware ecosystem that Samsung had built up. And David Un, who's now the chief innovation officer of Samsung, you know, brought me in um, to manage that accelerator in New York. And my vision was like, this is great. Number four is coming. <laughs> I, got my four startup. I got a little bit of time to figure out what it's going to be. You know, I've had some ideas with some other smart people. i got engineers around that can tell, you know. And the more and more I started working with, I realized this, you know, 10 years of tribal knowledge that I'd built up around companies, startups and access and the network, coaching, mentoring, advising was the most you know, rewarding part of my job at the Accelerator. And I was like, look, this is great. You know, I am, I'm, I'm, 
I'm feeling good about what it is. And, and you know, at that moment in time, you know, the opportunity opened up at Catalyst Fund. Uh, and I was introduced to the head of Comcast Ventures, managing director Amy Bance. We had a conversation around Catalyst Fund, right? And it's, you know, Catalyst is a $20 million fund focused on underrepresented founders. And, you know, they had a portfolio of investments and they needed somebody to come in and, you know, continue to one, manage the existing portfolio and two, make new investments, you know, moving forward out of the fund. Right. And so, you know, I was like, why wouldn't I do this job? Yeah. Like, this is the perfect opportunity for me. I'm doing something where I can mentor and coach and advise underrepresented founders. I knew how hard it was just as a founder. Right. I know how hard that struggle is as an African American. And so I was like, I'm jumping on it. So I came over and that was really, you know, why I got into venture, right? I was like, I know I'm probably only gonna cut five checks a year, right? Like a couple hundred thousand dollars. But if I can share my knowledge, my lessons that I've learned, access to my network, and help the other 495 people in the year that I'm not gonna invest in become better founders or help them along the way, then that's what I wanted to do. So, you know, let's take a step back quickly uh, and, and revisit the Catalyst Fund uh, and, and its, um, its kind of space under Comcast Ventures. I'm um, gonna talk about, you know, the influence Comcast Ventures is kind of having um, with a fund like this you know, what they see is happening in the future of, of entrepreneurship with these new demographics of founders that are building these companies and how ultimately that's gonna lead the Catalyst Fund um, to end up being really successful in the future. Absolutely, so, you know, I think overall, like when you look at Comcast and NBC Universal, you know, the recognition and understanding of what's going on in the US in terms of demographic changes and media distribution you know, we acquired Telemundo, right, um, to address a market need, right, that we know is very real. Um, we started a venture capital firm early on. It's an 18-year-old fund. Sorry for the noise in the back. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of construction going on in the streets of New York right now. I don't know the clanging going on. Um, but, you know, I think when you talk about, you know, catalyst position inside of Comcast Ventures, right, the head of our fund is a female. Right? There are not a lot of venture funds for the last seven years that had partners, never mind managing directors, who run the funds, who are leading those efforts. And there's a recognition around content, media, the changing aspects of where we are. And so when this fund was set up in 2011, you know, this was an effort intentionally set up to address you know, an underrepresented group. And we'd always done well in female, uh, founders and entrepreneurs, and we continue that. You know, if you look at Catalyst last year, 60% of our investments were female founders, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we're proud of that. Obviously, it's our focus um, in terms of diversity, but we think that the inclusion aspect is key. And so, you know, the fund, the support, right? We use the same back office, same legal, same accounting. You know, our returns analysis runs through the exact same hands of everybody else, right? So this isn't a you know, set up to be a charity. It's not a corporate social responsibility fund. We have CSR and that's great, right? But you know, we spend a billion dollars in procurement on African-American and Latinos at Comcast, NBC Universal. A lot, I don't know if you go anywhere else in any Fortune 100 company in the US and say that we procure a billion dollars products and service from African-Americans and Latinos. So, you know, it runs deep inside of the organization and there's a tremendous amount of support for it. And you know, we continue to deploy capital year over year and support our efforts. So whether that's following on pro rata, super pro rata, writing big checks, you know, we've now deployed a $3 million check when historically we've been cutting 250 and 500K checks. We're deploying our average check size of 500K. So the support is there, the fund continues to deploy. And, you know, I think that there's an appetite to do even more, which is great. Now that you're on the other side of the table and you're making investments, um, what are you looking for? What do you, are you looking for things that kind of excite you in terms of like you were seeing like a reflection of yourself in some of these entrepreneurs or how do you make those investments decisions as you're, as you're looking at the yeah. landscape? I mean, founders, 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 right? Like inevitably when you look at, you know, the portfolio that we've pulled together, you can go through undeniably just being like best of breed founder in this space. Gaming, media, D to C, it doesn't matter. They are the brand. They are the individual who is leading the effort. 
So just to kind of follow up with that, right? So that's kind of, you know, our side of the table and, and we've had tons of conversations, been able to build a relationship with you. Um, and, and it's great to always kind of rehash these things. But on the founder side, you know, there are a lot of black and Latino founders that are like, oh, it's great. We hear what you guys are saying, but like still, I don't know anything about this world. I'm building something. I have traction. I have revenue or, you know, I know this is a scalable business. What are the first steps I need to take? You know, how do I best position myself to be ready for investment um, and to tell that story? Yeah. I think, you know, I would say venture is a relationship driven business. And there are individuals who passed on my first two businesses who invested in my third. Right. right? And that was seven year gap between that period. And I gave them monthly updates and told them the good, bad and ugly and what I learned. And so I look for honesty and transparency in that story, right? I may not invest in the business now. I may have challenges, but the best founders I know have continuously built that relationship with me. There are probably only 10 people who probably want to invest in your business. There's billions of dollars of venture but there's a lot in the late stage growth, there's a lot in enterprise, you might be in consumer. When you get into consumer at this stage, at this product level, does it match this investment thesis? There is so much that goes on, so many entrepreneurs and founders who I know who make it a point of talking to every VC on the planet and that's just not a good use of time. Right, right. What, you, what you need to do is find the individuals who are blogging and talking and at conferences speaking about the same thesis the same industry, and even if they disagree with you, you want to get in a room with the person who disagrees with you and have an intellectual conversation about why they formed that opinion and what they've seen and what data points they're drawing on and layers out and have a real conversation about that. And it's fine if you walk away and you don't move the needle on them, but you want to be armed the next time somebody asks a question and say, well, I heard this guy speak. I heard this woman comment on this and this is what her concerns were. What do you think about that? I'm looking for somebody who can have an intellectually honest debate about their business and where it fits in the market and why it's gonna grow. We are at a point in time where accelerators, bootstrapping, finding a way forward and leveraging the resources you have to gain traction before you raise venture capital is very real. And it's starting to change, but that's just the state of affairs. Right. So you gotta keep grinding. There's no other option. And as a quick follow up to that, you know, um, I think it's really important to speak on that a little bit because I, I do think underrepresented founders at times get hung up on the fact that they are underrepresented. And, and what do you on a lot of times dealing with with these founders, what do you try to tell them about, you know, their experience and not letting that affect the way they're they're uh, operating? Yeah. Um, raising money is hard for anyone. Right. Let's be very clear, like raising money is difficult for anyone. It's, say, 10x harder, right, for African-American Latino founders, for female founders. I don't know what, exactly what the number, but at least 10x. And so what knowledge you have of your market when you're going out is your superpower. You've got to focus on what differentiates you from everybody else. Embrace that. You have to be your authentic self. If you're not, then there's no reason to be a founder of a company anyway, because you go and put the mask on and go and work at a big corporate, right? right. So exactly. if you're gonna do that while you're fundraising and you're running your own company, then it's definitely not worth it. Right. You might as well get the check, definitely. right? So you need to be who you really are. And that comes through. People can see that. Like at a human nature level, when you walk into a room, if you're uncomfortable in your own skin, people are gonna pick up on that, right? And so, and have hesitations on your story and what that may be. I think that's a, that's a great way to wrap it up. Yeah, man, that was a really good, really good point. I mean, I think the thing that Yvonne and I, especially when we started New Age Capital, was we, we wanted to be our authentic selves because we didn't even see that within the industry. We didn't see anybody who reflected what we believe, who looked like us, who talked like us. And that's one of the things we wanted to make sure that the founders that we invested in, or at least the founders that we attract, you gotta keep it 100. You gotta keep it real, you gotta keep it authentic because that is the thing, that is your true differentiator. There's nobody else like you. There's nobody that has your experience. And if you're able to utilize that, you can be very, very successful as we can see with, with your story. Yeah. So, so man, man, appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate, yeah, sir. appreciate you uh, taking some time with us, Kai. And uh, you know, we look forward to uh, making some more investments with you in the future. Pleasure, um, always. And, and continue to uh, be at the forefront of, of moving that cruise liner. So, appreciate it. Right. Today, we're chatting 
Let's say chatting or speaking. Kai is a serial entrepreneur who sold his last company, Pixie TV, to Samsung. <laughs> wow. All right, whenever you're ready. Uh, you're a little out of the shot. <laughs> you're killing me out here. Thanks for kicking it with us this episode. To learn more about New Age Capital, check us out at newage.vc. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for more dope content. Bless up.